Amen. I can't help but think of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Amen. Children know it's that time. It's that time for children uh, ages 8 and below to be dismissed to Children's Church. Children ages 8 and below. This is your opportunity for separate activities for your age group. Again, while they're making their way downstairs, the choir's making their way back into the auditorium, I'd invite you to make your way to Romans chapter 2 this morning. Romans chapter 2 as we continue to work our way through this wonderful epistle that Paul wrote some 2,000 years back to the, to the church at Rome, to that com- large community, that influential community, that center of governing and, and social power in the known world of his day. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Today we will be uh, looking at the hypocrisy of judging others. You see the title on the screen there. In just a few moments we'll have some points to make from the sermon. I would encourage you to... Uh, follow along in that. There's an outline within the context of your bulletin. You can take notes in that. How many of you have heard of the running of the bulls? A lot of hands going up. A lot of hands going up. Of course, that was glamorized or glorified, if you would, by Ernest Hemingway in his 1926 novel, The Sun Also Rises. But that is actually a real thing. It occurs every year in Pamplona, Spain. And as I understand it, hundreds of thousands of people will come from around the world to either foolishly run in front of the bulls, I I can't think of a better term to use than that, or just to observe the events, but it's a a very uh, heady festival type environment for nine days. There's a lot of uh, uh, people that are celebrating, there are a lot of people that are just filled with adrenaline, and again, as, as hundreds of thousands of people come to this Spain uh, to, to, to witness the running of the bulls, and, and history, at least recorded history, beginning in 1911 to the present, there have been 15 people killed in the bull run since the recorded record began, and the most recent death occurred five years ago. But this is something of great irony that happened this year. His name is Bill Hillman. He's 32 years old. He's a Chicago-based journalist. And he's an expert on the running of the bulls in Pamplona, Spain. He even co-authored a book titled, or subtitled, How to Survive the Bulls of Pamplona. That's the picture, the copy of, or the front cover of his book right there. But, on July 3rd of this year, 2014, just knowing about bull running, even knowing enough to write an instruction book on how to run the bulls wasn't enough. On July 3rd, a 1,320-pound fighting bull named Bravito lagged behind the pack just before entering the city's bull ring at the end of a rain-slicked run in the annual festival. And at the opportune time, You got it. That bull, Gord Hillman, the author of that book, in the right thigh. And Gord, a 35-year-old Spanish man in the chest. Now the good news is both men survived. They're on the road to recovery. But the co-author of this book, How to Survive the Bulls of Pamplona, said this, and I quote, Perhaps it's time to upgrade the book. (laughs) Enough said. Enough said. The hypocrisy of judging others. Today we're going to look at one verse and one verse only. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. I invite you to, to, if you haven't made your way there, to find that book or find that verse in the Bible. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, your neighbor will share with you. Otherwise, you can find a copy in the pew pocket in front of you. I'm asking if you're willing and able to rise with me as we honor the reading of God's Word on this, His day and this, His house among these his people. From the New American Standard, Paul writes this one verse, this simple verse says, Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. 
For you who judge, practice the same things. Join me in prayer. Father God, help us this day as we examine this singular verse to take from it, Father, the message that you have given me, which I believe, Father, is intended for this house this day. Father, I ask your blessings upon me as the messenger and those who will receive. Help us to be changed and transformed and renewed as a result. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Before we get into the working outline of today's sermon, I just want to give you a little context of this. If you've been with us in recent weeks as we explored Romans chapter 1, especially beginning in verse 18 on, 18 through uh, the final verse 32, you know that in those verses there was a lot of condemnation, a lot of uh, uh, just blunt language about sin, particularly certain sins that were going on in Paul's day in the city of Rome. And likewise, in our day, in the nation, the society in which we live. And there is a lot of, of uh, really just condemning language in that chapter. Now, chapter 1 is written largely to a Gentile audience. Now, the Gentiles are those who were outside the Jewish faith and traditions. They were not born of the seed of Abraham. They were not part of the lineage of God's chosen people. They were Gentiles. Gentiles just meant everybody else, everybody who was not a Jew. And certainly in Rome, we know that there were many Gentiles, non-Jews, who came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, professed faith in Him, and became Christian. Just like there were many other cities in, in the, the days of the New Testament and even beyond. Thank God for that. The Gospel has traveled across every every uh, continent we have. Most people groups have been reached. There are still some we need to reach with the gospel. But thank God that we have access to that. I, I am not a Jew. I don't have any Jewish blood in me that I'm aware of. Um, likewise, most of you are not probably, I can uh, assume not from the Jewish race, but the, 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 the blood of Christ covers everybody in their sin. Amen? All who would believe. But in, in chapter 1, as Paul is writing, reading this, or writing this very condemning language against certain sins, it's written primarily to the Gentile listener. And I can, I can just picture this, as this letter is being read publicly to the church at Rome and being circulated among the Christians there. I can just imagine that the Jews, those who were born of the, the seed of Abraham, those who were brought up, Jewish in blood, though maybe not in culture, they're kind of snickering among themselves and saying, yeah, you peoples need to listen to this. This is something that y'all need to listen to. And indeed it was. But, but Paul, as we get into chapter 2, he turns his attention from the Gentiles to the Jews. And the Jews who would try to seem kind of smug and a little bit arrogant perhaps as being God's chosen people, in chapter 2, he's going to say, now hold on boys, y'all got problems too. Y'all got problems too. And this verse here, chapter 2, verse 1, is just really starting the transition of that. As he's shifting his focus from the Gentiles, those who are born outside the seed of Abraham, to the Jews themselves, those who have always pr uh, prided themselves on the privilege they have of being God's chosen people. And today we're going to look at that where he's talking about you have no excuse yourself. If you're passing judgment on them for their sin because you yourself are a sinner. And when you condemn them for their sin, you're just really casting judgment on yourself for your own sin. So we're going to look at the issue of hypocrisy today. Hypocrisy, and again the title of this is the hypocrisy of judging others. Well, let's talk about, let's get to point number one. What, what is a good definition for hypocrisy? And I'll give you a suggested definition in a few minutes. But I want to consider first the following news story. This happened last year. Uh, 2013, April 2013, in New York City. Uh, on April 20th, 2013, New York Police Department officers raided a drug den in a Brooklyn, New York neighborhood. The police found a crew of five men in possession of 23,000 pills of oxycodone. Those pills had a street value of 
$1,000. Apparently, the men had used and stolen prescription sheets to obtain these drugs. They were also accused of peddling heroin and cocaine and having a sawed-off shotgun in their possession at the time of the arrest. But here's the twist to the story. The men routinely texted. You know those little phone things you got? Uh, those phone things, uh, I don't know why we call them phones. Teenagers don't use them to call anybody. But uh, <laughs> not, not, not saying anything negative about y'all. You know, I, I swear I'm going to come up with a, just a texting thing. You know, save the phone part off that. i am become a multi-millionaire as a result of that. Steve Jobs got nothing on my ideas. But at any rate, these, these drug dealers would text their customers at Friday night. This is what one text would say. We are closing at 7.30 on the dot. And we'll reopen Saturday at 8.15. So if you need anything, you have 45 minutes to get what you want. Here's what they were doing. The drug dealers were closing for the Sabbath. Every week. Every week. A little hypocritical? I would say so. I would say so. Now consider another story. This is one of those big oops that happened. I hope not to you. A man who professed to be a Bible-believing, church-attending, and totally abstaining Baptist one evening had the pleasure or the misfortune, however you want to look at it, of dining with his pastor. He was excited about this particular restaurant they were going to. Uh, and and the, the place that he had recommended that he take the pastor to had some delicious guacamole dip. And he couldn't brag about it enough. He had everyone at the table anxiously, look, anxiously looking forward to this wonderful dip, but to his chagrin, the waitress did not bring any of the dip with the appetizers, and neither did she bring it with the salad or with the main course. Now remember, this man's been bragging about this guacamole dip all evening long. But the man saw other dinner guests enjoying guacamole dip and was quite irritated that none was sitting on his table. So he finally confronted the waitress publicly about the apparent oversight. Where's our guacamole dip? When I was here last week, we had some of the best dip I've ever eaten. I see other tables have it, so why don't we have any of your special guacamole dip on our table? To which the waitress changed the mood of the table when she replied, Sir, we only serve the guacamole dip to those who order from the bar. Ouch. Ouch. If you want to define hypocrisy, this is the way the Holman Bible Dictionary does it. It says, it gives a little bit of background, it says that the word we call hypocrisy or hypocrite is based on an old Greek word. The original meaning of that Greek word was really just to give an answer. Back in the ancient Greek society, that word uh, could be applied to, to anybody who's like an interpreter of dreams, for instance, or an orator, or a reciter of poetry, and to an actor, an actor. So one definition of hypocrisy could be this. An actor on a spiritual, on a spiritual stage. An actor on a spiritual stage pretending to be more spiritual than what he actually is. Think of that way. Think of it that way. An actor on a spiritual stage pretending to be more spiritual than what he actually is. And folks, for the church, that's a problem. For the church, that's a problem. According to the Barna Research Group, back in 2008, they did a survey of Americans, American adults who do not attend church and found that 72% 72%, nearly three out of every four, believe this. They believe the church is full of hypocrites. They believe that. In other words, nearly three-fourths of our unchurched neighbors are likely to believe that those of us who are members of a local church are merely acting on a spiritual stage. We come to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. We act all goody-two-shoes. We act all better than thou, and then we go about our regular routine. In other words, they have seen our sinful actions, and they're tired of our condescending judgments. You know, Jesus spoke about the hypocrites of his day. 
In uh, Matthew chapter 6, for example, he warned those who practice their righteousness in order, or practice their righteousness before men in order to be noticed by them. He, he warned them of their hypocrisy. He warned them about drawing uh, attention to themselves when they give to the poor. He warned them about praying in order to be seen by men. And he, 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 he talked to them about the, 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 uh, their use of flowery language and repetitious phrases when they prayed in order to seem more righteous or something. He, he, he called them a bunch of hypocrites. He, he was saying that we must stop pretending to be who we're not. We're to stop pretending to be who we're not. We are, we are to avoid the temptation to be actors on a spiritual stage. Let me pause there for a second as you digest that. Before we want, move on to the next point, point number two, let me emphasize something that I assume you picked up on your own. The whole point about avoiding hypocrisy by simply embracing our sinful nature and pursuing a life of sinful pleasure is not what I'm talking about. I'm not saying to give up the act and just be who you are. Does that make sense? In other words, I, I don't...